All right. Very cool. So we are going to do a couple quick uh, little demo paintings. Um, I love painting on to kind of a disposable surface, something I don't care about too much. But I guess if any of these really worked out, I could cut them out. There, it is on a wood panel. Um, it's been gessoed with gray uh, gesso or probably white gesso with a touch of a black acrylic paint. Um, and uh, I've got my typical primary palette or split primary palette over here, two yellows, two reds, two blues. Uh, my yellows are, I actually have a cadmium yellow light instead of a phthalo or instead of a, um, anyways, it's a, so it's going to be an opaque yellow. I've got a transparent Indian yellow here. I've got naphthol scarlet, which will be a semi-transparent red versus like if I was using a cadmium light or a cadmium medium, then it would be a very opaque paint. I've got a transparent uh, quinacridone red. I've got a semi-transparent uh, ultramarine blue and a semi-transparent manganese blue. Oh no, this is a transparent manganese blue. Um, and so then my titanium white will be quite opaque. I've also got a Payne's gray, uh, which is normally a fairly opaque color, but when I use uh, the 1980 brand, it is a semi-transparent. And then for brown up here, just for density, like if I'm gonna be doing some ground areas and stuff, I went ahead and grabbed a burnt umber, very strong, very dark, uh, thick color, especially if you mix burnt umber with ultramarine blue, you get some beautiful, beautiful darks. Any questions on the color I am using? All right. So could we're going to start Could you with, say the, the name of the scarlet again? Uh, Naphthol, N-A-P-T-H-O-L, Naphthol Scarlet. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. I'm just going to do some really quick paintings here. I'm sorry, did you say burnt umber? Yeah, actually, I have burnt umber. I never used burnt umber, but I grabbed it instead of Indian red because I wanted something strong and opaque to put like for the ground planes. So we're gonna do that um, kind of tonalist painting really quickly here. And I'm not gonna try to capture it exactly. I'm gonna kind of pretend like I'm out plein air painting and just trying to get the essence of a thing, getting it real quick. So I'm just making up a, I mixed both my yellows, a bit of titanium white. I'm gonna add just a paint, a touch of paint thinner. When I say a touch, I literally mean just the corner of my brush. That is one of the biggest mistakes I see people doing is using too much um, too much uh, paint thinner and you get a really runny surface. And I'm just using a big chop, uh, chip brush here, like from a, like from Home Depot. And you just want to get this kind of covered. Um, Trying to figure out what kind of energy do I want to capture in this. Let's see if I can zoom in a touch more. So you have no reference at this point, right? Just the remember when we were looking at that kind of uh, ah yeah yeah yeah. Yeah. I'm just kind of thinking back to that one. It was kind of warm. Kind of the horizon line was a little warmer. And no medium. Uh, a touch of paint thinner at this point, just the game saw, just a touch, just to make the paint go a little faster. I'm kind of warming up my horizon line. So I added a little more Indian yellow. Now I'm adding a little more uh, of the naphthol red. And, the, and again, it could be, it could be a cadmium red medium, it could be a cadmium red light, whatever color. Wipe my brush out here. And I'm just, again, I'm almost just pretending that I'm, whew, that brush got a lot of red in it. I don't want that red where I'm going here. I'm gonna get just to the top of this. I'm gonna do a little bit of a cooler yellow towards the top, a little more white.
All right, so I've got kind of a nice, loose ideas of some color here. Um, I'm going to let this slowly get towards gray, but it's going to go from kind of a warmer to a cooler. And let's change brushes. I don't want to just use that big chop brush. Or chop brush. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of the different brushes I'll be playing with today. That paper towel already made a big mess. Um, one of my favorite brushes for clouds, especially when I want them to be loose and organic, is I love these shop brushes, these chip brushes. Um, I do use those a lot. Uh, Egberts, the long, kind of really long bristles. They're really flimsy and soft, and they really make a beautiful calligraphy. I'm going to challenge you guys to watch your how you're holding the brush um a lot of times you you know if you're holding it like this all the time you're gonna get yourself in trouble and you're gonna end up making the same mark over so remember we want to hold it like a conductor and i still remember when michelle said in one of my classes a year or two ago like harry potter like a magic wand right like so we want to hold our brush as often as we can like that it takes a while to get used to but you really will end up changing your pressure a lot the angle of the brush a lot more often when you hold it like a conductor or like a magic wand and you hold it from the end of the brush we're not choking up on it too much there's <laughs> times for that and there's times to hold our brush like this but you'll really allow the brush to do what it wants to do, to make the calligraphy and the motion and the strokes. So <laughs> it sounds like you're talking about tennis, how to hold a racket. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and it, right, it, it's a lot the same with the pressure and the, you know, the, yeah, I don't know. I'm not a good enough tennis player to say that. Um, I, another brush, I've never even used it, but I have it and it's a dagger. Um, my good friend, Brenda Boylan, who I paint with all the time, she uses dagger brushes all the time. Um, I know that, uh, yeah, there's a couple of painters that I really like their work and they use them. So I bought it, but I still haven't used it. Um, but they're really great for grasses and different more slim things. Um, I don't know. I should experiment with that. Um, I've got my typical flats, which again are my chunking interlocking bristle brushes. Um, they're this kind of my workhorse and about 80%, 90% of my brushes are flats. Um, I used to buy a lot of the shorter flats, but now I really want long bristles. They hold more paint and they can do more calligraphy. Um, my flats, as I beat them up and I use them, they in turn become filberts, right? The edge quality, the edge, I lose the sharp edges. So I don't buy filberts. I just make them by being mean to my brushes and scrubbing them down. Um, yeah, more of these Egberts with just different really long bristles. And then I do have a couple brushes here that are really soft. This is a synthetic mongoose. I believe it's a synthetic. Maybe it's a real mongoose from back in the day when you could actually still buy them. Um, but it's really soft. I want to make sure that I'm only using this brush for either detail or really soft softening edges. Um, if I try to do like I just did here where I was just scrubbing on, I will destroy this beautiful, soft, expensive brush really quickly. Um, there's also synthetic uh, brushes that have really nice, soft, beautiful hair. Um, and synthetics, I almost find keep their um, shape better. Um, so you want to experiment with when do I use a really soft brush? And when do I want a much firmer hog bristle brush? Um, the soft synthetics are great, again, for blending. They're also really nice for detail or really uh, ornate, like just kind of the branches and fine lines. Um, and then that brings us to our makeup brushes, <laughs> our mop brushes. So I just went and grabbed a couple from my daughter. She does more watercolor and acrylic painting. So she has these um, and I just borrow them from her when I need them. I don't have any oil painting mop brushes. And I, in fact, I didn't use them until recently. Um, 
they still throw hairs like crazy. But one thing I've really found is I rarely use these to actually load up and put paint on. They're just not strong enough and they get gummed up. So a lot of times what I do with them is, you know, loading up a little pile of paint and then I can use them to blend that out to soften that. So how do you, how do you clean them? Uh, I clean them just the same. I will pull the paint from them. And because I'm not really using much paint thinner or anything, it's kind of a dry brush technique. I'm not getting them. Once I dip these in paint thinner, I almost can't use them again until they're dry. Um, I found personally, um, otherwise you'd really have to squeeze it out. So I just squeeze out as much paint as I can. And then I would dip that into the paint thinner and just pull it out again. Again, I don't really use my mops very often to uh, load paint up. That being said, I definitely saw online a number of painters, maybe from more than, um, uh, what's his name? Um, the happy painter guy, Bob Ross. <laughs> um, I've definitely seen painters who do use these to paint clouds. I think they'll get their shadows in there. And then they just kind of load it up with white and just start. And I mean, it makes some nice effects kind of, but it looks cheesy to me. Mm -hmm. It looks, I don't know, I love Bob Ross. I don't want to ever want to put the, you know, the man down, but it, it does kind of have a very much a Bob Ross feel, but there's, you know, probably a time and a space for it. Um, but uh, well, It looks pretty good to me. <laughs> right, exactly. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, again, it's just kind of, it definitely could have its time and its place. Hey, Michael, what did you say you use that Egbert brush again for? And is that just gotten at a paint like a Dick Dick's, Dick Blicks? Yes, I believe so. Um, what, what do you, the shape was elongated. What, what do you use that for again? I'll show you here in just a second here. Um, I'm just playing with this to see what happens if I add some color to it. Instead of just having a black and white, I don't know. Hey, teaching is so funny because all of a sudden now I'm like, oh, I want to play with this. It is kind of fun. So yeah, you could do some pretty interesting things for sure with that, I guess. Um, maybe. I haven't experimented as much with the uh, mop brushes. Again, I was pretty heavily biased for a lot of my painting career of no hog hair, flat brushes can do pretty much everything. And by, you know, I, I was kind of a minimalist in painting. And um, so I was constantly, you know, what, how little can I use to create the most effect? And I still believe in that to a degree. Um, but uh, but I do, I, I really open myself up to more and more experimenting, more and more trying different tools. Um, and uh, yeah. You know, um, a palette knife, uh, like where you have that highlight kind of yellowish color, if yep. um, a palette knife can, you can go from the, the edge and kind of sweep out very lightly, very, very lightly, like far as, you know, totally parallel to the surface of your canvas. And um, it makes a really nice kind of um, just a wispy soft edge. So if you wanted that edge to go into the blue, you know, you just swish up and, and it, it makes a really nice edge. So just, and by edge, you mean soft edge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So just kind of pull this 
little yes. pile of paint that I just put on there and just pull it Go up. up. Yeah, very, very lightly and just kind of a quick stroke. Can you guys see that? That's nice. Mm -hmm. I never thought to use palette knife for that kind of thing, but I saw a teacher do that and, and it was pretty neat. Yeah, so fun, fun. Okay, let's get back to, I'm going to go ahead and use my Egbert to create these um, clouds up here. So we'll get some grays going. But they're a warm gray, so I'm going to add red to it. And they're not too dark, so I'm going to add white to it. You see my grays, I just... So you can see the bristles are long and they want to get, they're very flimsy, very soft, but I can touch them. I could add just a touch of paint uh, medium if I want, just putting out a dab of it. So I can make a little bit slicker. And if I wanted this to be really smooth, can you guys see onto the surface? And you see like all the brush strokes and stuff. It's a pretty messy surface. Do you guys see that? Yeah. Okay. So I'm just going to mm -hmm. smooth that down just really quickly with uh, this nice soft. It's picking up a lot of paint because I don't have much on there. So I'm going to get a little bit. And it's just a nice soft, barely skimming along the surface. Um, it's not fully my style. There's a hair on there. I'm getting hairs off. It's always so hard. <laughs> there we go. Oh, just put it right back on. Sheesh. All right. Forget the hair. Yeah. So anyways, you know, you can use that if you want it. Um, I know some of you guys do like a more uh, smooth kind of perfect surface. So that kind of helped. Um, got my grays mixed up here. I'm just going to kind of create a couple dabs of gray. Just mix just a touch of paint thinner into it. Uh, not paint thinner, a little bit of medium, just barely, barely, barely. Sorry, let me stop that. That's my gallery in Salem there. Um, anyways, going from the bottom up. So I wanted a little bit light, a little bit warm. I love just how this brush just dances and moves along and I'm barely touching the surface, just kind of loading that brush up. And really watch how this paint, how this can just dance around and just make such nice marks. I'm changing my angle. Let me zoom out so a little bit so you can see my hand a little better. So I'm changing the angle of the brush from direct to the side to, you know, 45 degree angle, changing the pressure of the brush as I'm using it, letting it dance and move, turning it so that I've got different edge quality. And, you know, again, we just talked about Bob Ross. I love the happy accident thing that he says. And it's sometimes you're just, it's not happy accidents so much, but you're inviting you're inviting a little bit of unknown. You're kind of like, well, you know, let's see what this brush does. You kind of are, you know, directing it and you have an idea, of course, but you want to be open to the unknown and just What did you gray the burnt sienna with? What's that? 
What did you gray the burnt sienna with? I, I so far haven't used any burnt umber yet. Oh, burnt umber, I mean? Oh. I haven't what? dipped into it yet. What? So, oh, so. I, I was using the um, Payne's gray. I used a little bit, and then I purpled it down. And then I had the yellow from the background. So when I mix that purple into that yellow, it creates these different kind of warm grays. So I'm just kind of using some of what's on there um, combined with kind of different ideas of what the colors could be. Um, and I'm just kind of looking to the grays. They're all definitely colors that don't have really a name. They're all what I call the ishes, you know, purple-ish, gray-ish, uh, pink-ish. Um, and I'm just trying to get them. So what I'm going to do now is before I come back in and add more highlights onto these clouds, I'm going to take my little soft brush. So I'm going to, I was going to use the little um, mop brush. Let me see if my daughter has a couple more. They're in paint dinner already. Hmm. She may have gotten smart. She might be hiding them from me now. Um, <laughs> all I have are great big ones left. Um, but I'm going to use one and just see because I want a diff. I want variations. This all this already has kind of a density and a softness, but I want some real softness. So I'm just going to take some of these clouds and really kind of obliterate them so that they really kind of come secondary. They're not focuses. Or maybe I'll take just a little bit of the edge, maybe the tops of them, and just soften. So I have a combination. Not, you know, not everything's soft. Not everything's firm. And uh, you know, some areas I can really soften. Some areas I can really leave with better edges. Now let's come back in, clean that brush. I'm going to add a couple highlights. The problem with demoing <laughs> is I'm always kind of in a rush. I don't want to bore you guys. And no. Brush boring. So instead of cleaning, oftentimes I'll just pick up a new brush. And now what is that orange again? The name of that orange? Indian yellow. Okay. So let's kind of figure out our sunset is going to be, our setting sun is going to be. So, Michael, do you use both Indian red and Indian yellow or is that? The, the transparent earth red? I, I wrote down that you were using Indian red, but is it Indian yellow? Did I make a mistake? You did or I did. Um, yeah, it's Indian yellow. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And it's actually called India yellow now. They've changed oh. the name. <laughs> I go to Blix and say, give me Indian yellow. <laughs> uh, I think they only changed it this year, or last year. So they probably know what you're talking about. But Michael, you do mention from time to time that you use a transparent oxide red or a transparent Red. Yeah, earth red is, is what it's called from gambling, but every every company makes them. But yeah, transparent oxide brown or red, yeah, um, is one of my very favorite colors. I don't have it on this palette right today. Yeah, but I use it all the time, especially for my under sketching. And uh, yeah, I love making my black and whites with it, or my you know my value based yeah. paint with it. it. Yeah, it's a wonderful color. It's what I kind of consider like the sepia tone. Um, uh, anyways, I'm already, you know, pretty done with this sky. I'm just going to kind of create some transitions of where the light's coming through a little more, maybe a little more red. Um, and uh, a little more transition. You can see how quickly I can get things done. I could also same thing as I could come back in and even lighten that that sky with some more opaque yellow to actually get in there and make it a cooler. 
I'm gonna pick up a little blue, let it get to green just a touch. There's a little bit of blue over here by my white. And I can cool down the top of my sky just a little bit if I want to. Even though it's gonna get lighter, it's gonna feel a little bit cooler and I gotta be careful. I'm definitely picking up some of that underpainting there, I think, or maybe it's just a dirty brush. It makes a nice difference. And last but not least, let's just very quickly stumble in. Now I've got my zoom back out even a little bit more so you can see the colors. I just grabbed a little bit of that burnt umber, mixed it with a touch of Payne's Gray. Could even use a little bit of ultramarine blue. Makes a beautiful dark. And I'm just going to, I'm going to mix that with some warmth real quick. Make a real dark red. And I'm just going to scumble that, drag it really lightly across the here. Get back to the dark over here. And let's put a dark shape or two down below. Don't need to overly describe it, just like we were talking about. Um, and let's get into, just use some of these colors that are in that sky so that it relates. I'm just gonna kind of lighten up some of this a little bit. And let's see if that works. Nope, not light enough. I'm just gonna grab a palette knife and I'm gonna take some of these colors that I've pushed down too much so that they're hard to get on my brush. I use my palette knife a lot just to kind of reload my colors, put them back into a pile. So now when I dip my brush in, I've got something actually to grab. I can load that brush up and Go. Kind of, kind of hints at some ground there. Hopefully, you could even uh, maybe possibly let's see if we can pretend there's a little bit of a pond in there. Let's see. It's popping. It's coming. Hopefully, yeah. And hey, Michael, while I'm thinking about it, this is Lisa. Can I? Uh, speak to the class for a second about Indian yellow. I've fallen in love with it because of my current obsession with the desert. And I now have four different brands. Mm. Um, and the the Williamsburg Indian yellow is amazing. So for any of you that are interested in a, a really warm Indian yellow, it, it is beautiful. That is really good to know. Thank you. Yeah. I know that some of them really are brownish and you can't get them really vibrant. I use the, um, I use Gamblin's and it does a great job, but I will definitely, definitely try. You said Williamsburg. I've got Windsor. Yeah, Williamsburg. Mm -hmm. I, I have Gamblin. I have Windsor Newton. I have Michael Harding. I have, I, they're, a, they're multiplying on my palette, but <laughs> Williamsburg for me is just like the be all end all. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right. So there was my kind of soft in the edges. Let's wipe that off with a little paper towel here. Um, all right. So here we have kind of a nice combination transition. I'm going to go warm to cool on this one and uh, a little more variety here. I'm going to start with kind of a pink down towards the bottom. 
Oh, look at that beautiful. I, salmon is my favorite color. I don't know why. I just, in oil painting, I just, I used to be, I used to have people tell me they could tell my paintings because they always had salmon in them. And I just, <laughs> I love So how it. do you, how do you make salmon? Uh, my, for me, it's the, a touch of Indian yellow with quinacridone red and a bunch of white. <laughs> So I'm just going to put a little more white in that to let it start to cool down as it gets away from the horizon. And it's actually going to get to green here, I hope, towards the top. So it's got a lot of transitioning to do. It's going to be kind of a grayed down muted green. I hope, I hope, I hope. So I'm not going to clean my brush all the way. I'm going to leave some of that salmon on my brush because I want to, um, I want to contaminate my green because I want it to gray down. So I know that salmon and green are kind of opposites. So got my green now, I just mixed. I'm gonna add quite a bit of white to that. Because it's gonna be a pretty light green. And as I come down here, man, I really know that I, I really want it to be pretty mellow. I'm gonna put this bluey green right on top. See how that looks, it's pretty strong. So probably gonna want more. And I'm gonna want some salmon in there because <laughs> it's too strong. There we go, see how that, adding a little bit of salmon in there just neutralized it. Still greenish, but it's much more neutralized. I love experimenting with colors that are odd together and seeing, you know, green and salmon or gray down pink, gray, no, gray down really soft green with salmon. Could that work? I don't know. Let's try it. Maybe I can let it get a little bluer towards the top. All right, let's see, grab one of my big mops here. No, let's not do that. That'd be too nice. Let's grab one of our big shop brushes again. This is a great big guy. I can drag him across the, across it real quick. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take some of this salmon and I'm gonna drag it into the sky so that it's actually really kind of contaminating that green. Just softly. Dragging it kind of back and forth as I, so it's got a real soft, soft transition, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to mix kind of a grayed down purple again. And let's just see what happens here. You, know, you guys see the color? So I grabbed a little bit of my Payne's Gray, which again is a transparent because it's a cheap one. It's the student Payne's Gray, the 1980 brand. And I actually like the transparency in it because I don't, I'm just using it almost as a color just to, uh, kind of, uh, well, I mean, I am, I'm using it as a color. I know that it's a, a very blue gray. So look at that, I haven't added any blue to this. It's just Payne's gray and quinacridone red and it made a very gray purple, which is what I was after. Okay, so now I've got three values. Got a very light, cool, purpley gray, a mid, a little bit darker purple gray, and then I've got a warmer 
purple gray where I just added a little more quinacridone to it. Let's grab our Egbert brush again and let's put on some crazy clouds over the top. So a lot of time with just an, a little bit of pressure, I can really do a lot and just let it kind of dance along. I gotta kind of figure out what shape I might want my clouds to do. I've kind of got everything coming back here. My light source probably feels like it's hanging it back here. Oh, that's pretty. That cool purple while it was warm on my easel. But when I put it up here next to that salmon, it's sure nice and cool. Letting that kind of do a little bit of the dancing there. And I'm going to kind of It kind of, you know, starts to pull off the brush. So I got less and less and I can, I can actually use that to create softer edges. Mm. And I go to my slightly darker version of that color or cooler, darker. And let's drag some clouds across the sky here. Barely, barely any pressure, just letting it skim right on top. If I push down, it's blending. Okay, and I don't want it to blend just yet. I want to pick where I'm blending right now. I'm just putting down paint, nice and soft. Is this making sense to everybody what I'm doing? How mm -hmm. you, by changing your pressure, you can really Now a little bit of dark on the tops of them, a little more, little more of the gray. All right, I can keep using that brush, but I have this nice soft brush right here. This is one of the, um, I don't know if this is it. I wanna look for one of the really soft ones. This is like that mongoose hair. So now I can use that to just kind of, Move that and blend a little bit, but a very, very light touch. Where do I want crisper edges? I'll probably leave that alone. Where do I want soft edges? I'll just kind of drag it along. And let the clouds as they go further away from the horizon line really dissipate, get soft. Watch how the brush is turning and twisting. It's changing the shapes. I kind of wish that more of this pink salmon color was popping up. I think it brought that cool cloud a little too high, but that's okay. Things that, you know, you're painting. You're having that conversation, you're kind of like, well, if I did it again, I would do that. Or if I cared more about this, if I was trying to do a finished painting, maybe I'd mix more of the salmon. Maybe I can even pick some of it up and just bring it. Let's see if we can hint at it. There we go. Perfect. Wow. The right. green doesn't look so green. It looks a pale. Yeah, and you look over here, look how green it is. Yeah, pale blue. It's beautiful. All right. Yeah, I'll be curious when we take the tape off if uh, if it how green it looks. Anyways, making a bluey green gray. That get darker, bring in a little more paints gray.
when you add that base, um, the bottom of your of your pictures, it really brings it um, back into into focus because I can't see inside your head, so I don't have a reference picture for <laughs> what you're trying to do. <laughs> I would not want so, to inside my head. <laughs> well, yeah, I got that too. But. Thank God we can't. It makes a lot of sense when you, when you ground it. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, you don't know, and I'm just kind of, you know, throwing stuff together and experimenting. And yeah, that, now I see it. Right. Yeah. That Is fun? that sky over water? I don't know. <laughs> because the the paint's gray looks blue. The yeah, it looks yeah. like almost like an indigo kind of blue with. Yeah, I don't know. Um, Let's pretend it's not water. Let's add a little warmth to it. And okay. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Just a grand vista. Okay. It'll do for. Yeah. It's... Boy, these quick little studies are really cool. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we already got one going on up here. This was our crazy uh, blah, 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 blah one. Um, don't know. Maybe I'll just. Pull that off and try again. You want to, should we try doing one with just our uh, <laughs> makeup brush here? Start, no, Alex. don't start over. <laughs> What's that? Start over. Yeah. Oh, gee, I, I just saw a cumulus nimbus cloud there. So you're almost yeah, making a thunderhead. Exactly. Let me clean up some space over here. Who knows, maybe we'll end up with a really nice gray. Let's see what we have. So Michael, do you ever do these little ones and then you know, see one or two that you like and, and then make a larger painting from it? Oh yeah, or at least grab information from it. You know, mm -hmm. little, so the good thing here is I can't mess it up. I mean, I can, of course I can mess it up, but I, I don't care. Mm -hmm. So I'm free. I'm free to do the things that I'm too scared to do on a painting that I'm going to try to, you know, help pay for my daughter's college with or right. buy food for my family with. You know what I mean? You yeah. gotta, there's times for practice, there's times for experimentation, and there's times for, for performance. See, look at that gorgeous gray. Maybe I'll be able to use that. So I'll pull that aside, and now I've got a great Wonderful gray. It's funny whenever I'm giving demos and I have a couple of grays on the side and everybody's like, ooh, how'd you make that gray? And I'm like, just by cleaning <laughs> my palette. And a lot of times what I'll do is I'll clean the warms colors and put those in a pile. And I'll uh, clean the gray, the cool colors and put those in a pile. So then I at least end up with a, a warmer gray and a cooler gray. Like over here, we've got a grayed down kind of yellowy, ochre color. Not as useful right now, but. Who knows, maybe grab a little paint thinner. It's important for me to, uh, you know, clean my workspace from time to time. Takes a couple minutes, but, you know, if I end up trying to make littler and littler and littler piles because I'm too lazy to make space, uh, just making what painting, which is already difficult, even harder. All right, let's go crazy Nimbus cloud style. Got my gray, got some blue, and I'm not, I'm not too stupid. I'm, I'm being stupid. I'm not so stupid. I'm going to mix it with my palette knife. I should not use a makeup brush for mixing. I'm just asking for trouble. I'm just trying to make some nice, dark, but usable grays. Back to the purple, man, my, my cloud shadows always want to go to purple. Mix some yellow into that. Which blue again is that one on the upper right-hand corner of your palette? Manganese. Manganese blue? Manganese, okay. Yeah, so basically when I choose my colors, I'm looking for one blue that leans towards green and one blue that leans towards purple. 
and basically the same thing goes with my reds, one that leads towards purple, one that leads towards orange, and then with my yellows, one that leads towards orange and one that leads towards green. Is basically kind of my theory in uh, when I'm picking my colors for my palette for the day. Um, I used to be really specific and use the same colors over and over and over, but cadmium colors, you know, they're not supposedly the safest. Also, they're quite expensive. Um, so, you know, I've been finding other colors that I can use, and I do like transparent colors. So instead of just saying that I use the same colors every time, I use the same theory every time. Two reds, two yellows, two blues, two yellows, two reds, two blues, white, and then a couple guest colors sometimes. And uh, within that, I... Um, within that, I will uh, be able to make most all the colors that I want, or at least close enough. Wow, look how moody and stormy that looks. It's That's great. <laughs> I'm just cheating my way through this one, just using what's already there. Give me one half second while I clean a brush so I can... So again, this is not how I ever, ever, ever paint clouds. I never use a makeup brush. And I see people on YouTube and stuff doing that where they just use these big soft brushes to make clouds. And, you know, they look so generic a lot of the time. They just look like cotton puffs floating around. I definitely don't want that. But in just that experimenting that I did earlier, I was like, ooh, that's actually kind of fun. There's little, there's little glimpses of a thing in there. What if I, you know, this is experimentation day. What if I... Push that. What if? I definitely, you know, just like probably everybody that went to art school, you come away with all these biases and preconceived notions. And it's funny that it can take a long time to get over those to just kind of begin to question them and just go, well, is that actually true? You know, are those just cheap gimmicky brushes? Like, you know, the uh, fan brushes, I never use those because, you know, one of my instructors in college told me that they're, you know, they're gimmicky and they don't really do much. And then, you know, you see uh, Bob Ross calling them his pine tree painting tr brushes. And, stuff. <laughs> um, and, you know, I prefer to, think that I can make them all with my so this is really a different type of mark making for sure it's impossible to control and for one I'm using a giant mop um, I do have my little one but it's already been used and um, I'm just seeing if I can at least give the semblance of the beginning of a cloud formation and then let's see what happens when I come back in with some brushes and give it a little more structure. Moody, 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 big cloud bank. That's going to come down here and then let's just bring this cloud. Um, the hard thing is, once you get them contaminated, it's hard to, to get them clean because there's just so much paint that they're carrying. Plus, I'm out of white, so I'm being lazy and not reloading my, my stockpile up there. So I got to get back up in there and do that. All right, just going to soften some edges, and then I'm going to come in with some smaller brushes and kind of finesse this, give it some color and see if I can't make this actually look like something interesting. 
Well, let's see. Beautiful. I feel the air and the softness in that big white cloud. Yeah, it's kind of got that. Man, I pulled out like 20 brushes before class and I've used well over half of them already just because I'm, I'm trying not to clean very much. All right, let's squeeze out some white because we're being lazy. Don't be lazy, Mike. All right, so I'm kind of thinking where my brightest brights are going to be at the tops of these clouds. Maybe it's even mix a touch of yellow in there to warm them up just a little bit. Just a little bit. Now we're gonna let them get a little cooler as they come down. <laughs> Crazy. All right. I'm having fun, but I'm scared. <laughs> I have no idea. So now I'm just going to come back in with my shadows I, and give it a little more structure. Michael, are you just blending the colors together or are you mixing a transition color? No, I did mix a transition. I mixed a pink where the white turns to gray. There's a bit of a pink in there. load that up because I want to have this cloud come down quite a bit further. All right, I'm already wrestling. I've got a lot of paint on there. So having a little bit of an issue, but let's see. Using this Egbert might not be my right brush for this, but I wanted to create some kind of a feeling of movement and uh, All right, getting fussy already, even though I don't even know what the heck I'm doing. So I just kind of kind of get to remember like we're just making the illusion of some clouds, kind of some storm heaviness. There's a little bit of light kind of peeking down below. So the bottoms of them really heavy. Maybe, ooh, maybe we can do our rain coming down off the bottoms of them, possibly. Let's see if we can get away with some of that. Okay, we're going to bring rain down from here. Okay, now I'm finding it hard to move forward without some darks, right? Because right now that's really dark, but I need some darker darks to uh, ground it. So let's give it a horizon line right there, bam. Well, that made a big difference. Right? I know. Look at how all of a sudden the clouds, I mean, it's a weird horizon line, but.
that's how uh, I get it when I uh, paint with wet and wet. But I don't like it, and I'm starting to change uh, things. Maybe that's what I'm doing wrong. Yeah, it's not easy, but it, it's really a good skill set to have because especially if you want to ever get into plain air painting and doing like that, where you have to be able to just keep painting, keep painting. Um, it's definitely easier in the studio where you can take your time and let it dry and let it layer and uh, everything else. But um, there's some effects you can only do wet into wet and there's some effects you can only do what, you know, with scumbling and dry brushing. Um, and so you gotta, you know, it's, you wanna kind of keep working on both. You wanna keep experimenting. I mean, I, I have lots of friends who only do a la prima or only do plain air and that's great. I'm just not that guy. I like all of it. I like to continually experiment and try new things. And I wish sometimes that I was kind of one way or the other, because I think I'd probably be better at if I just kind of mass tried to master one thing, but I just enjoy playing and experimenting so much that I'm uh, constantly, you know, how'd they do that? How'd they do that? I think that's a good thing. Otherwise, you kind of get stuck in one mode. Right. Yeah, I don't know as far as like marketing and sales and having, a, you know, a very predictable outcome to your paintings. Mm -hmm. I think there's definitely benefits to, you know, the artists that literally know what their painting is going to end up like. I'm, I'm always kind of surprised. <laughs> because yeah. playing. I'm, you know, oh, that worked. Oh, cool. You know, um, but again, like I, I do know that there's times when there's times to play and times to experiment times to uh, perform practice performance and play Ooh, somebody should write that down i just did <laughs> all right practice performance and play i like that i probably heard it somewhere but you know just in case copyright michael orwick All right. That was weird. <laughs> Never painted like that before. That's good. I this. like it. Right? Yeah, it's kind of fun. Kind of fun. Beautiful. Let's see with uh, this big palette, this big just crazy shot brush, shall we? Just kind of looking through some photos I have over here. Okay. What color do I want? I don't know. Green, gray, yellow, sure. you guys see how low my horizon line is on each of these? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why is my horizon line so low? It's, it's all about clouds. All about the clouds. What about the clouds. Yeah, that's one of the biggest gives you can give to your viewers is by literally just, you know, what kind of real estate are you giving? It's, you know, about 20%, about 10%, about 10%, about 15%. You know, all the rest is sky i love the sky yeah and you you know you live in big sky country you live in you should I definitely know. be painting that sky i can see clearly at least 60 miles away Isn't that wild yes that's pretty rare here in oregon i know in louisiana also <laughs> kind of gray i'm just 
What are you mixing? <laughs> Everything. I don't know. That's what I was just saying. It's kind of just a gray. I'm using some of these grays. I'm mixing them with a little bit of blue and then letting them. I'm just using some of the paint that's on there for the most part. This is going to be another sun set, sunrise. Yep, it sure is. This is a sunrise this time. I don't know why. <laughs> Sunrises oftentimes will have more purples and blues in them. They're cooler, the atmosphere that's uh, developed on the earth overnight has a cooling effect, whereas in the sunset, oftentimes is re reacting to the dust and all the, uh, the uh, <clears throat> contaminants and uh, pollution that have been kicked up during the day. And, the, you know, and it's been warm all day, so the moisture is not knocking them down. So I do notice that when I paint sunrises, a lot of times I will have more, more um, <clears throat> blues, purples, grays, and then at sunsets, we'll have more of the reds, yellows, kind of, the, you know, I think there's a reason it's called the golden hour. I could be wrong. No, well, you're right. All right. <laughs> I see it every day. <laughs> you think that's why? You think it's because of the contaminants and the pollution? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sometimes we'll have like, you know, 30 mile an hour winds all day long and the atmosphere is so full of dust and the the sky just gets like on fire you know just and pollution from all of the farmers fields and stuff that they are yeah, spraying and yeah, doing that's what really made me notice it was um in the late summer early fall when all the fields are being tilled up you get the most amazing sunsets right you know all that dust being kicked into the air is what really as a young boy made me kind of go oh Look at all that red earth being kicked up, you know, red dust. Exactly, exactly. And then they burn. Uh, sometimes they'll cut and bale the stalks of the cotton plants, just like they do the cotton. Once they pick all the co cotton, they'll uh, cut the stalks and bale them up. And then other times they'll just light the field on fire and the whole field burns. Yeah, so we that. have dust and smoke. They don't do that in Oregon anymore, but I do remember that when I was a kid. I remember oh, catching the, the uh, ashes from the field. They're kind of wild west here. Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> they do stupid things here. Where are you again, Linda? I'm, I'm halfway between Phoenix and Tucson. I'm actually probably 10 miles oh. closer to Tucson. Uh, 20 miles off the interstate, about 35 miles from the Mexi Mexico border. And um... all right, so really quickly, I'm going to I'm just going to keep using this shop brush just to show you how many effects you can make with a 35 cent brush. Um, I just went and added a little warm pink on top. I cooled it down by adding a little more white and I'm just going to come across and let's pretend that the light is kind of coming up from here and it's going to illuminate some of the undersides of some of these clouds that I accidentally made. <laughs> and let's see how that looks. So I'm just barely, barely letting that pink paint just kind of scumble and bounce around, just not pushing. If I push, it will blend. I'm just letting it sit on top. And that is really the key of wet into wet is just being so delicate. Again, our instinct is that we feel like we got to push down hard when you want to add paint on top of paint. But the truth is, it just let the paint pull itself off the brush. There's just a little enough of a stickiness to it that will just kind of grab it. If I made a bigger pile, I could actually start piling it on there and change to more of a yellow, add a little more yellow to that warm it up to the next stage. Is pretty much the chroma going to be the most intense right at the horizon? Uh, oftentimes, yeah, but you could have 
atmosphere like we do here. Um, so there's like a little bank of clouds that are kind of interrupting it a little bit. Um, yeah, so, you know, it can be for sure. Yeah, and often, well, it, the chroma is often going to be kind of brightest either near the sun or where the sun is hitting strongest too. Um, unless it's like midday, then, you know, it's just a white cool light. So then it's not really pushing the chroma on clouds where this is, you know. That right. one artist that you mentioned, Martin Johnson Heed, uh, who would have that like one sort of cloud standing out there really bright. Sure, yeah, I really would, yeah. Push that. So now I just kind of darken the pink. See if I can get away with that a little bit. Cooled it down, I hope, but it's because it's kind of a higher chroma, it's feeling a little. Are you going to save this board as a future instructional? Because um, these are just beautiful. Thank you. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I, it is wood, so you can just cut it, um, you know, and if they really work out. But otherwise, yeah, it's kind of a fun instructional piece of wood to drag around to my workshops and stuff. Um, I'll show you another one that I did before in another sky painting class. And maybe some of you were in this class, but um, mm. just, you know, this was not about the clouds, but this was about the bands of color in the sky, how it has kind of a red band almost always, even just completely different times of the day. I think I remember that. Cool. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. I Beautiful. this one. Do you know, are you familiar with something called museum board? Uh, is it like a gator board kind of a thing? I don't know. I was that's why I was asking. Um, I saw there's a guy named Farinella, Farinella, Farinello. He he does a lot of these small um just playing. Uh, and he, his whole entire thing is just clouds. Um, and they're really kind of amazing. But he said something about using museum board. And and because uh, I was thinking I'd like to pick up something to do this that's not real expensive or heavy. Right. Something smooth, you know. So yeah, the bone core or the gator boards. Are all really lightweight. Um, they have a foam middle, but they're really. Uh, um, yeah. tough. Can you um, gesso right on foam core? Yeah. Really? I want to make sure it's an acid, you know, acid free one. Um, they've got ones that even have a copper band in it that really, I guess, is great. I've never painted on any of those. Um, all right. I'm going to hmm. cool down that horizon now. You see how I'm turning the brush. So I'm not just, I'm never making the same mark over and over. And this brush will have a very organic messiness to it that I can always go back and fix or I can utilize.
Mm -hmm. I want to pull the tape off so bad. <laughs> Badly. <laughs> I want to see them, what they look like clean. Well, um, I'm going to keep painting. I'm going to go ahead and cover these just because I want to pull the paint off, the tape off. But um, mm -hmm. you guys, class is over. Um, we're already 10 minutes long, but if you guys want to hang out with me, you're more than welcome. I'm going to keep painting because I'm having too much fun to stop. Um, and it mm -hmm. will be recorded. Um, your homework this week, for those of you that you know actually have a life and need to get going, um is a is a sunset um experiment 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 have fun play I mean, look at all the different tools i still haven't even used my palette knife yet um but i've used like six seven ten fifteen i'm just counting them really quick brushes here plus the ones in the thing um and uh yeah so experiment and play uh Try wet into wet, be brave, practice uh, alternating your pressure and getting, you know, so you can just keep painting and painting and painting um, and uh, have fun. Um, but yeah, if you want to hang out, I will be here for a little bit longer as I figure out what to do for these last two panels here. Michael. Do you think it's better uh, to paint uh, the next time uh, out of fantasy uh, instead of uh, taking a photo? And uh, if I take a photo, I try to uh, copy it. Well, I don't know. All these are kind of, I mean, I'm looking at different things like this kind of inspired this a little bit. Um, this kind of inspired that. So I've got little things kind of that I'm looking at. That was the yellow one was the one we were talking about when we were looking at the uh, different artists work. Um, this one is just kind of some colors that I like. Um, yeah. So I don't know. I, I think it's nice to have something kind of a reference. But yeah, what I want you to do, um, Irina, is we have something here we call the artistic license meaning you can go in there and change whatever you want to change and manipulate whatever you want to manipulate. And I want you to feel free to do that. I want you to feel free to, to have uh, fun and make it whatever you want to make it. So, you know, if, if, but I find that if I generally, I have a hard time starting from nothing oftentimes. So starting completely out of my head, can be really hard, but having a little bit of something, a little jumping off point is what I call it, um, can be useful for me. Um, so, you know, if you can do it without anything and you want to try that, then yeah, like I said, I want you to experiment. I want you to play. I want you to try new things. So if that's painting without any references and you're okay with that, try it. Uh Maybe I uh, will take a reference photo, but uh, uh, then I will use a lot of my imagination. So I, I will experiment. So, uh, as you said, because uh, before this, I tried to to be as close to the photo as I could, as I as I could. Yeah, and that's you learn a lot from that. There's nothing wrong with copying photos, because then we kind of can tell, oh, I'm not doing something right, or, you know what I mean? You have a base to um, measure it by, but but I don't know. I like, I, I, I'm, but I've also been painting for a long time, Irina, so I'm constantly, um, you know, using everything. I'm, you know, I can base a painting on music, I can base a painting on feelings and emotion, but I will generally, grab references so right now like right now i'm just grabbing this one i just have stacks and stacks and stacks of photos um before class i went to my little book of current inspiration which i have here and it's just a three ring binder and within it i just have lots of photos that i think might be good references 
and little pieces or maybe they're paintings I'm working on. And so I'm constantly different references. Um, and so I have so many references that I, I never have an excuse to not paint be, that I don't have. I never think I don't have something to paint because I have so many references. I can literally just open that book and I'll start painting. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Okay. Michael, did I come into class an hour late this morning? Did you guys have time change or something? Yeah. Yeah, we did. So you so it's one o'clock there? No, it's noon o'clock here. Noon, noon. Okay. It is noon here also. So I missed the whole hour. Oh my God. It's recorded. It was okay. a, it was a student critique. Okay. Okay. Good deal. Hey, Linda, um, yeah. we're on the same time as you for six months of the year, and then the other six months were an hour below because my father lived out there and oh. got caught up in the time change. Oh, good. So now we're the same time, but then in six months, you'll still be at that time, but we'll be an yeah. hour earlier. It's so uh, nice never to change. Oh, God. Uh, when is time change? Uh, it, uh, in America, what day is it? Uh, it it's on different days at different uh -huh. seasons. And this year, I think it was on the twelfth of March. We they sprang uh -huh. ahead. Uh -huh. sprang so ahead. you've changed the time already. They yeah. just did. They the states that change. I think there's three or four states that do not change, and our state, Arizona, does not change. So we stay standard time all the time. I wish yeah, I wish we didn't. I think Oregon's not going to. I agree. I agree. <laughs> so do I. Are, Irina, what time is it? Uh, are Are you in Russia? No, I'm in Sweden. Uh, oh, okay. It's quite. Uh, it's quarter past uh, eight. In the evening. P PM. In the oh, in PM. The evening. Okay. So you're taking evening classes. Okay. Oh, I'm yeah. prime time. <laughs> yeah. Yes. yes. <laughs> Perfect, Michael. So I just covered this with a dark gray. And I have a very dense sky. Now I'm just mixing a little bit of well, kind of my peach again. Let's try a palette knife. All right. That's fun. Oh, wow. I love that color. So with palette knife, you generally want to apply from the bottom of the knife, not on the top. Um, you guys probably already know that, but um, it definitely makes it a lot easier. And again, it's the same thing as with the brush is that it really does come down to um, a light pressure. Michael, I have like only used the palette knife on that one last painting that I've worked did and and um I had my waves kind of at one part of it was the wrong angle and I was so pleased to see that I could take that palette knife and just scoot the waves to a different angle just a slight little I could take them and just scoot them and and I was really happy to see that. That's really cool. Yeah. I know that Power knife is definitely a neat and interesting tool. Um, not the easiest to learn. And it also, I do notice just like a painter that's holding their paintbrush like a pencil, 
Um, I do notice that a lot of uh, uh, palette knife paintings have kind of the same mark over and over. And that's probably why I don't like it is there's just the same, but now like with the palette knife, with the brush, with the combination, you know, I can kind of come in and soften those edges. I could also probably soften the edges with my um, palette knife as well. But uh, yeah, you can get some really interesting, nice marks and just a combination of thin and thick and everything else, so. When I had difficult uh, to put uh, the paint uh, on the canvas, uh, mm -hmm. I took the knife, uh, palette knife, uh, and put put it with the knife, and then spread um, the color with the brush. Perfect. That's exactly a, yeah a great way to do it. Also. Um, you can use the palette knife to remove the paint when it gets too annoying or too thick. Yeah, okay. So if I wanted to, I could just kind of come back in and scrape little pieces of it away. Um, I can almost do that now because I know I'm going to want to add some trees. So let me just know that I'm going to add a little bit of tree here. And here. Is your horizon line right in the middle? Pretty much, yeah. This one is. Just because I didn't plan it out. Because <laughs> I wanted the reflection. <laughs> so, good job, bad job, me. Good job, Michelle, for seeing it. Bad job. <laughs> me. Well, I have this teacher, you know, who drills stuff in our in our heads over and over. Sounds like a jerk. <laughs> yeah, thank God he does. <laughs> thank God for his patience. Then <laughs> like an annoying fella. All right. So now I just grabbed a brush. You guys notice how beat up and crazy that thing is? That's an old, old, old shot brush. Just making some nice, quick marks. You know, it might be a little on the cheesy side. It might be a little silly, but it's, you know, I'm just, I'm kind of just painting fast. I'm just, mm -hmm. just painting a different effects and seeing what happens. Um, it's almost like painting without a filter. Yeah, yeah. You should hear the, all the bad words in my head as I'm doing this. <laughs> it's beautiful, Michael. It's beautiful. Oh, you're too sweet. You're always too sweet. Or so no. sweet. I shouldn't say too sweet. I appreciate your sweetness. No, I think it really is lovely. It, it, it almost it almost looks like cypress trees in the south on a really hard, stormy day in the swamps and in the marshes and and the sunsets breaking through the clouds. That's what it reminds me of. Yeah, I can see that. Kind of beautifully haunted. Yes, lots of history in those swamps. Oh my goodness, now this is gonna be the Coupe de Gras. Oh my God, that's gorgeous. Right, with yellow contrasting the gray. Yes, look at that, in that pink. Oh, it gives me goosebumps, it's, it's so beautiful. Oh, thank you.
Okay. Now, I'm gonna take crazy messed up brush here and see, risk ruining everything. And let's see. Just because it's evenly balanced, I'm gonna bring some kind of hint of ground to make it less perfect. 50-50. Might be, you know, more than it's needed. But, you know, we're just playing. We're just playing. We're having fun. I don't even see the 50-50 anymore. <laughs> Good. It looks almost like a little mist back there, too. Oh man, I want to pull this tape off. <laughs> one more, one more. <laughs> Gotta earn it. All right. What the heck are we gonna do now? Oh, I got it. It'll be brilliant. <laughs> you know the one um where the where you were saying how the sunlight just blows out all the color and it gets so bright. Yeah, from, yeah. From the upper right hand side of the piece. Yeah. Would you Maybe want to try something like that to show how you. Let's see. Yeah, the other one I was thinking about otherwise was more like this. Oh, okay. That's. Oh, yeah. that's nice. That has a little bit of that in it. That or this is one, otherwise, a real dynamic, angular one. I like the more subtle one myself. Yeah. But. What does everybody else think? I well, like that, that one too. That obliterated uh, sun one too, if you want. I can see, let me look back at it and see if it's something I think I can do quickly and easily. Mm. That's gorgeous. I spend all my time playing. I got to make some money today. <laughs> <laughs> You'll cut those up and that, that'll be thousands of dollars. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right, let, give me one second. I'm going to see if I can find that um, <clears throat> painting we were talking about. Hmm. Okay, let's try it. I'm going to try for the blown out one just because that's different and interesting and will sure be a strong contrast to this dark gloomy night. on YouTube. Give me one second. Just clean a brush. Now that made the horizon line just receive Yep. Yeah, just it's funny. I mean, that's just all due to glare. Yeah. Oh, it's differently when you drag sideways versus horizontal brush strokes. But it's it's a crazy, almost cheaty kind of effect you can do. It's literally just by taking that broken up brush and just lightly, lightly dragging it, all of a sudden just changes and it makes these a little grayer. Mm -hmm. It's gorgeous. Hmm. Okay, boy, oh boy, oh boy, how are we going to do this crazy guy? All right. You haven't <laughs> stopped to think about any of these other ones. Why start now? <laughs> That's it. Go for, you're on the fly. Jump. Jump. That's it. Feet first. Mm -hmm. Brush flying. All right, let me clean a brush. I love cleaning brushes. <laughs> if I lived them. near you, I'd go clean your brushes for nothing. Uh, <laughs> that's just basically well, a messy brush with basically straight um, manganese blue. Mm -hmm. And I had a little bit of 
ultramarine into the corner just to add a little density of the blue. Mm -hmm. I love that. that saying straight from, out of the. Is, is, it, is that? Do you add some gamsol? There's a touch on there. Yeah, I just want to. Otherwise, this board is pretty absorbent too. So, which I like, but I, you know, for speed. You didn't do that with the palette knife one though, did you? Add any gamsol? No, you're right. Probably not. Love it already. <laughs> Sold. <laughs> the third person on whatever. Hairs, hairs, hairs everywhere. <laughs> I have to clean up a big area because white is going to be very important or warm, really bright colors. So I'm going to need a big area. Wow, we got paper towels everywhere at my feet and I'm falling out of the garbage can. Oh my goodness. Hmm. It's a very vibrant blue. It's beautiful. It's raining here. Rain, rain. We've had a lot of rain in February and March. Hopefully the ground is able to absorb some of it. Yes, it's been doing pretty good because it was pretty wet. This has been the most wet fall and winter and spring that I have experienced in 23 years of being in Arizona. Wow, interesting. Feel so bad for California. They're getting so much rain, but they, you know, probably most of it is just running right off into the ocean. Yeah, yeah exactly. that's sad. Yeah, they're having to release it from a lot of their reservoirs too. Oh, God, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah. You know, Phoenix has a huge underground uh, caves or something, caverns under under the earth, under the city that they store water in. They have like a hundred years supply. Oh. That's amazing. California used to have a lot of water under the ground, but it takes a lot of time for it to, to go down into the aquifers. So yeah. it won't refill for a very long time. Michael, this is so basic, but um, you know, I, I, I've, I've seen where people have like three jars and they have, uh, you know, Gamsol and two of them and, and they pour off the top. Um, do, do you have a practice that you do with, yep. you know, your, your Gamsol? <laughs> do, you, do you keep using the same? Gamsol daily, but just the top part or? Yep. So it goes down and it gets dense down at the bottom. You can just pour off the top. Yeah, I never pour it out. I just keep reusing it, keep reusing it. I've got about five jars of it in here. Um, just save your pickle jars. But, but I mean, uh, but I mean, do you start with a fresh Gamsol every? day and then pour it off or do you just use what is on the top of the existing muck yeah so my uh gamsol container has a screen in it so most of the muck goes down um so i only clean it about once a week maybe maybe more depends on how much because remember most of the time when i'm cleaning my brushes i'm pulling off most of the paint before i even touch it to the paint thinner. I'm having a heck of a time finding clean brushes. All right, there we go. So Michael, do you ever uh, clean your brushes with uh, soap or? Maybe like once a year. Okay. Um, I actually have beside me, I have a, a container filled with oil. Um, oh, okay. With uh, 
uh, canola oil you canola oil, flour? Yeah. so i will once a week or so oh, clean that but then i gotta clean that back off too because mm. otherwise that it's a drying oil eventually it'll dry so uh the, does the canola oil you wipe your brushes clean before you would paint does that alter the I guess it doesn't alter the pigments. No, because that's the oil that's in there with them. Um, but I clean it off before because mm -hmm. it slows the drying time down a lot, which a lot of people like, oh, but I oh. my already dry so slowly. Hmm, I'm curious about this. It's so cold. I wonder how he's warming his up. Let's try adding a little yellow, a little pink. What do you do with the muck that settles in those jars? Uh, you're supposed to dispose of them properly with your city. Um, um, you know, if you have like that recycling where you can leave uh -huh. car oil and stuff out. You could order. You can do that. Um, I just put them in the jar and seal the jar up and throw that away sometimes, but I know that's not a very good idea. I shouldn't have said that on a recording. I didn't hear what you said. Evidence. <laughs> Michael is responsible for the Earth's issues. <laughs> responsible for the flooding in California. No, no way. But, but Michael, I'm still puzzled by, I mean, if you have a screen at the bottom, like, like you you showed two jars, one that looks almost full of muck and the other one that is less full with a little bit of cleaner on the top. Yeah, and but, I have other jars that are pretty full. And and so, so do you daily kind of pour, pour it out into that, into the, into the muck jar? um no what? whenever i need to mm -hmm. whenever it's just not getting i'm not getting clean but it, because my my thing has a screen on it, it i'm not sure i can do this effect with wet into wet mm. because of the warm i need a little bit of warmth and it's um can mixing to a gray which i don't think i want that why you wiped out that spot? Well, yeah, because I wanted to put pure white on top of it. So let's mm -hmm. try. I'm gonna try a quick blend, and let's just see what happens here. Ooh, sticky already. So absorbent. Yeah, I don't think I'm going to get that blasted out effect. I'm guessing he didn't do that wet into wet. Because see how it's wanting to gray down? Mm -hmm. Might get some interesting sky, but I don't think I'm going to get that blasted out look. Well, that's a good thing to learn, right? Exactly, yeah, exactly. No, there's no, nothing's wasted today. We're just experimenting and playing and learning and taking mental notes. You know, I'll make mistakes and you guys will observe so you don't have to make the same exact mistakes. And then you guys will make different mistakes throughout the week and then we'll share our mistakes next week and <laughs> all learn 10 times faster. It's, it's our lessons. We never make a mistake when you learn something. That's right, you win or you learn. That's it. We're learning. So, you know, and I want to learn until I draw my last breath. There you go. Yeah, I mean, I don't think this sky. Yeah, I mean, it's it's got some of that already. Potential is there for greatness. Potential. Embrace it. I was starting to remind me of like a tabletop mountain out in the desert. Yeah. Okay. 
And on those bright days and those white, thin, pale, watery looking clouds come in. Oof, beautiful, beautiful. Green in the sky. It looks like um, reflections on a wet salt flat. Yeah, it does, doesn't it, kind of, yeah. Yeah, in Utah, yeah. With a whole bunch of brush hair stuck in it. <laughs> Good grief. <laughs> Cat went by. Yeah, this paint, this brush is like, you said you weren't going to paint with me. You said you weren't going to dip me in paint thinner. You said you weren't going <laughs> to love to paint with me. <laughs> So, Michael, for homework, are we doing uh, six uh, things like you're doing, or do we do a picture? Yeah, I want you to do what you're comfortable with. You know, I think, I feel like asking you guys to do six paintings is a bit much, but boy, would I love it if you did. Okay. Um, I want you to do what your, you know, what your time allows and what your life allows. You know, and if that's just one, that's fine. Um, you know, the, the homework is sunset, but if you want to, make a chaos you know be crazy like i am and do a whole bunch of them i mean you'll sure learn a lot especially because you'll be free right you're just playing and experimenting and you can't mess them up and so i'm just curious to... about what size is that board six uh, it must be an 18 by 24 must be okay. that was a 16 by 20 but it seems much bigger Oh, yeah. Sorry, kind of quiet right now. So I'm trying to. That's okay. Make this cloud look like it's got a rim light going on there. I was holding my breath. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Together. So I don't remember, Michael. Is that um, like just plain? board that like you got a dollar store or is that actually no cans? it's actually wood a wood yeah it's probably just an old birch panel and did I you have a gesso maybe i was out yeah, to lunch when you were <laughs> gesso on there pardon me i put the gesso on top so it kind of has okay uh, probably white gesso with a bit of a black acrylic paint mixed in with it just to oh, really okay a great. Bit of neutral. i think initially this board's been in there for a while I think initially I was going to do color wheels on top of it, um, but I never did. So I like doing my color wheels on top of the gray oftentimes. Where do you buy your birch board? Last, uh, last session of class, somebody there said they went to Home Depot and, buy, and bought birch boards. Where, where do you get yours? Um, do you have them cut or do you cut them yourself? Yeah. Uh, I get a lot of them, especially when they have that backing on them. I get them from a company called um, American Easel. Okay. Um, out of Salem. And then oh, okay. uh, tell them Michael sent you. They're, they're awesome. Okay. Um, but you can get them at art stores. Okay. Um, I also used to be able to order them a lot more often online. 
but uh, they were sent from Russia. So now we're not able to get um, birch from Russia right now. Okay. So you can't get uh, paint brushes or paints from Russia right now. Um, so I think it's coming from Norway a lot of the time, and it's much more expensive right now. Do you think uh, um, like Just, mat board or illustration board could work? That? Do you think mat board or illustration board, uh, Jesse? Uh, most work? mat board is not acid free. Mm -hmm. um, or maybe it could be. Um, yeah, you know, and then you just gesso it. Um, but yeah, they, they have the gator boards or the, you know, the different um, things. There's lots of different boards you can buy. Yeah. And you can use, truthfully, especially for stuff like this where it's just kind of play, you can get the, you know, composite board. You, again, you just want to try to get acid free, but, you know, they don't really know what's in them, even at the hardware stores. Um, you know, you can get the stuff that they make cabinets out of and um, just so those you can use all sorts of things. Yeah, I often find like scrap masonite in Goodwill and, <laughs> you know. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, a lot of these are just the backing from like picture frames, that little piece of cardboard that's in there, you know, mm -hmm. when I want to just experiment or do like my uh, color wheels and things i'm just uh yeah whatever whatever's around now that is gorgeous and figure out where i want my horizon line again does it need one i think my horizon line will be a bit lower hey craig i'm gonna wait i gotta turn this off So what we got, we got kind of mountainy landform way back there. But very light, very far back. And then coming closer, I don't know what it is because I can't see the picture, but some other kind of a crown form. I don't know what it is, but I'm not sure if it's important. It just kind of lets us know that the ground is down here. Mm -hmm. It looks like reflections in the water. Right. But this is too dark to be a reflection of the, of the sky. Yeah. It, it makes me think of like um, logs are part of a dock or something. Yeah, or like a bit of a jetty or something, yeah. Yeah, I guess I could just step closer to the picture. But right now it's kind of like, yeah, maybe it doesn't matter. This is kind of like where they always say, let the viewer yeah. <laughs> figure out what it is. Right. Person sees something else. So it kind of worked. I mean, it's not great. I could come back in and warm these up or I can keep adding to it, but it's definitely... I think more was, than I thought it was going to be. More good. the effect. I was kind of literally re about ready to give up on it and paint something else there, but the camera, uh, video camera, is kind of washing that out. We can't really see those strokes that you're making. Oh yeah, I'm just softening some edges. Is all. I'm taking the. The brush marks that I put around the clouds, kind of that um, halo light or whatever the uh, 
rim lighting on the clouds. I'm just kind of softening them a little bit to where Well, you did achieve that wonderful glow. Thank you. A painting. Half painting, half just picking up brush hairs. <laughs> but I'm using a very soft brush right now. Um, and I'm just kind of coming along and uh, using it to almost sculpt with that paint right here. I've got a big area, let's see. Yeah, so I can just kind of take it up and put it back down where I want it. destroy the painting as I try to get one stupid hair out. <laughs> Crazy. I it's used to have a retriever that spent all day in here with me and a big furry cat. So I used to just not worry about the hairs in my paintings. Just thought that well, that's part of my signature. <laughs> that's right. My dog's signature, but you know. Okay, now it's a way distant cloud. What's that? So now that spot is a way distant cloud. Oh, yeah, you know, and that's actually kind of what I was intending. So good. Just warming at the horizon line closest to where the light source is. Be subtle, very subtle, hopefully. Kind of one of those things where some things you want to draw attention and other things you just kind of want the brain to just in, kind of just pick up on without the viewer having to do much work. I think that uh, to experiment like you do, uh, you need anyway a lot of the um, you have seen a lot of uh, uh, clouds and skies, and you have a um, uh, I hate it there. Oh, my English. Uh, if you, uh, if uh, you don't pay attention to the nature, I don't think that uh, you can experiment that much uh, as you do, or. No, you're completely right. Um, I think that our ability to see deeper and differently than normal people see, and it's something you can develop. It's not something you're born with, but you learn to see differently and you learn to analyze. And eventually you're going to find yourself looking at nature and observing it. And then you're also going to be like, well, if I was painting this, what would I be doing? What colors would I use? What brush, you know, what if I was trying to capture this mood and this effect and this, and you'll, you'll start to see yourself doing that more and more often. Um, you know, it's like people who, you know, listen to music, they just, they hear music differently. And, uh, you know, it's, it's not a, it's, it's, it's a sensitivity. Um, you guys have all probably done that where you're like, um, let's say you're, you know, redoing your yard and all of a sudden you notice every yard you ever walk by or drive by and you notice all the flowers or you're looking for a new car and all of a sudden you're seeing all the cars that drive down, drive by you differently. Um, or even like if you've all of a sudden you heard a word that you've never heard in your life and all of a sudden you start hearing it all over the place. You're just like, did that word exist all the time? And I just wasn't doing it. So it's, it's a sensitivity that you'll develop as you uh, paint more and more, and you ask better and better questions of nature, of kind of what you're observing. Um, I swear, just like I said about that, hearing a new word for the first time, or, you know, um, there's times where I will see a new color that I hadn't noticed existing in nature. And all of a sudden I will start to see that color in nature. And it's just like, did my brain just wake up to this? 
it's so I don't understand it fully, but I really instead of I just think of it as a sensitivity that we're working on. So yeah, great, great observation. At one point, I realized that it's, it's almost you know, when you think about learning to paint. To me, it's more learning to see. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. We are now riding around uh, just for me to see, to look and watch and uh, observe things. Because uh, now I pay it, pay attention to things I didn't. Uh, before absolutely absolutely and it will really change like i always say that you know people everybody you know on their dating profiles or whatever says you know what's your favorite things oh watching a sunset but that nobody watches the sunset like a painter watches the sunset mm -hmm. i don't think so. we watch every minute and celebrate all these changes and you know also be like kind of pissed off like oh my god how am I ever going to paint this it changes so fast but you know we're really observing and the and yeah I just I love it I I hear that so often from my students of like you know even like in a workshop they'll be like the drive home was so different than the drive here you know after two or three days of just observing and studying nature and light and color and form and values and yeah. My husband and I walk together every day in the park and, and uh, we'll point things out. And so he's now much more aware because I'm taking these classes and, and practicing and, you know, of the lighting or shadows or things like that. It's fun. Yeah, that's so great that you're able to share it. And that makes it deeper, uh, deeper learning for you, too. When you're you're sharing it, it's kind of like the final step of learning, right? It's right. Here we observe, we do, we share, something like that. All right, I'm almost ready to pull off the uh, the tape. Yippee. Where's the drum? I, <laughs> I can't <laughs> wait. I'm excited. <laughs> All right, you guys held out a whole extra hour. This is where I find out the tape was too strong and just tears everything up. Oh no. So, Okay, here we are. Yay. You got to zoom out. Zoom out. Oh, yeah. Good call. Good call. Good call. If you don't mind, I'm going to set up my iPhone real quick because it shoots better quality. <laughs> that sucks. My phone just popped in and it said, you slept two and a half hours last night. Oh, no. What? I well, my wife has COVID, so I'm sleeping on a futon in my art studio. Wow. I thought I didn't sleep very well, but two and a half hours is kind of ridiculous. She okay. doing okay? Uh, she's yeah, she's on a meeting right now. I can hear her down there. Um, yeah, she got it. My mom had back surgery, and then my and then she had like a minor heart issue and so she had to go back in so she's basically out of the hospital for or in the hospital for a week out of the hospital then her lungs filled up with water and she, it was affecting her heart and then my then we finally got her home and my dad got covid and then my mom got covid and then my wonderful wife was over there helping them and cooking for them and she got covid so been a pretty crazy couple of weeks as far as family goes trying to figure out a good angle here all right look at those crazy crazy paintings looks like i need to zoom out one more time let's remove some tape there you go can you see it yeah perfect all right wish me luck Nice clean edge. Oh, yay. All right. Woo. Perfect work. Oh, look at there. And when you remove tape, you want to pull towards the painting. Mm. Oh, man. Might be some of my best edges ever.
I really did not think I was going to get six of these done in one day. That's a pretty full class, but I'm sure. It sure is. Thank you for doing that. Yeah, thank you. It it was very interesting to see, and it's very beautiful, very beautiful colors. Yeah, I really like this. I'd like to do more classes like this with yeah. the with the multiple paintings like that. Well, yeah, and again, you're just free to experiment and free to play, free to. I mean, all of them are different. Oh my you know, God, Michael! Our washed out light one, our big pink clouds, our golden one. <laughs> Uh, big fluffy moody rain clouds and wispy wispy uh, pink and green and yellow and gray and all sorts so man there's a lot of there's a lot of mood a lot of atmosphere every single one of them sunset ish I mean this is probably the least but I still feel like it's an evening light hitting in there um, and this is the one I probably change I don't like this repetition of shapes too much probably just merge this a little bit um, but all in all, quite gorgeous, fun. gorgeous, Michael. Thank you. <laughs> wow, frame that. Yeah, right. Awesome. All right, let's see what it looks like with the lights off. Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! This yeah. is so gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Very fun. All yeah, right. that last one yeah. really worked out. You guys were a treat, and uh, thanks for keeping me awake, evidently. <laughs> I, really, I don't think I really only slept two and a half hours, but. Uh, and thank you for being so generous with your time. Yeah, thank yes. you, Mike. Yes, thank you. Thank you, please, Michael. Please take care no. of yourself. Oh, yeah, no, I am, and I'm unfortunately really? I'm stay separate of my wife, and I've got our big air filter that is normally in my studio is yeah. down right next to where my wife hangs out, and it's got a antibacterial thing on it and everything else so wow <clears throat>